and I just looked at my phone, it was blowing up. Over 98 messages and voicemails, and I, I immediately said, someone died. And then I saw the first message was from CNN asking to do an interview about the death of OJ. All right, welcome everybody. One Degree of Scandalous with Tom Zenner and Kato Kalin. And of course, we're gonna be here with a special episode today. We we haven't had one for a little while because we're doing some exciting things with this show, but today is the day we have to talk. And Kato, yeah. um, wow, this is a, a monumental day. You know, this is something that I never thought. I wasn't expecting this because A, I had heard that he had cancer, that OJ Simpson had cancer, but I had not heard that he was on his deathbed. I don't think anybody did. So how did you get the news this morning? Well, I, first of all, I, I didn't know anything either. I, I just saw sometimes people would take his Twitter feeds, always talking sports, you know, and it's always saying, God bless. So I never knew he was sick at, at all. I, uh, I got in last night very, very early in the morning, and uh, I just was uh, getting up to use the restroom at about 7.30 a.m., and I just looked at my phone, it was blowing up of uh, over 98 messages and voicemails. And I, I immediately said, well, I thought something horrible has happened. And then I said, someone died. And then I saw the first message was from CNN asking to do an interview about the death of OJ. And so then I just read all the, the articles yeah. first. And then it was just, it's been continuous. Uh, and um, I kept thinking, um, as you know, we did some documentaries have uh, – of the 30 year and that's coming right up and uh in april here and then it's nicole's birthday it's may 19th and I'm, i was thinking well for, foremost it's sort of the uh, condolences to the kids condolences to the kids of uh of uh sydney and justin and arnell and jason that uh they lost a father and that's never easy to lose a father but my feelings go out to the goldman's fred and kim to hope that there's closure in their life. And I don't know if there will be closure uh, in their life. Um, and then uh, lastly, it's uh, thinking of the Nicole Brown Simpson, beautiful woman, Nicole Brown Simpson. And, you know, Tom, you, I, knowing her, she was this, I, I mentioned she's a beacon of light, always bright, always fun. Mm -hmm. And never, ever should anybody lose the memory of her and yeah. the, the, the two young people that died. And that's what it's really all about. So that's where my sure. mind went and still is going on in any any kind of interview or anybody that called. Um, and, you know, I got a, right before the show, I got a, a phone call from uh, Josh Peters from USA Today. And he got me in the car driving here. And I, he said, you have a few minutes. And I... I know him from articles and doing sports things with the Milwaukee Brewers. And I said, Josh, what do you want to talk about? And he just said, what you're asking, yeah. their feelings. And I, I thought, Tom, that it, when a person's on their deathbed and they know it, do they have a penance? Do they say the penance? And does OJ admit how he, if, does he say, forgive me for what I've done? I don't know. Does he leave a note? Something he, like that? And, do you think that would get it off his conscience if that would help at all? In, in that, and uh, I believe in heaven and hell. I believe there's a, where I want to go is upstairs. So I have no idea if he would he talk to the family, that he was surrounded by family of how it, how it was. Yeah. But in other interviews, I've, I've always said that I've thought that I've admitted I, that I said, I think he's guilty. Yeah. I've said that. So, you know, it's between you and your maker at that moment. But then again, it all comes back to the, the closure, the chapter's over. Everything in life that uh, will have a tri any trials that will happen in this world and in America especially will always be the template of the O.J. Yeah. Simpson trial. Always the template. Cameras in the courtroom. Everything revolves around that. It'll never – that will never die. Yeah, and, and we're getting a taste of it again, just how much his presence – how big it is, right? Even though he's dead. He died today. The trial was going on when he was in his late 40s, and he still looked pretty good whenever you'd see him. So this, I think the news is a little surprising for a lot of people that didn't know that he was this close to death or even what kind of cancer he had. But again, this is what everybody's talking about. Like you and I today, we've sifted through e uh, um, interview requests from everybody. You know, you name it. You name the show. You're going to be on him. We're taping this in the afternoon of Thursday. You're going to be on everywhere. We were both on the BBC already. You're going to be on Fox with Jesse Waters, Ashley Banfield. We got ABC. TMZ was outside the studio here, and I already saw something posted with your statement, strong statement this morning. But um, it just, you know, we're going to get into everything here too, folks, because you know Cato, and if you've just found our podcast, go back and watch some of the past episodes. We've covered so many angles of the O.J. Simpson saga, from Tom Lang to people that were witnesses to uh, someone that saw O.J. leave the scene of the crime and almost run her over to reporters that were there. So if, if you're fascinated by the O.J. Simpson saga, 
you've got the right podcast here. So make sure you subscribe to our channel here and give this one a like. Uh, but this is where you're going to hear Cato, Cato unfiltered for right. about 40 minutes. So Cato, um, you mentioned closure. Does this make you, you're still processing all the feelings, I'm sure, but did you need something like closure or have you I, come to peace with everything over the last 30 years and just I, the, the highs and lows that you've had a ride with this? I, I think um, it's it's more about the, the families of the victims. Of uh, if, it, if they have closure, that's more important to me, if they have the closure. I, I think, um, you know, I think it's horrible what OJ did to them. I think it's horrible that they think about it every day of their life of losing a daughter and losing a son. I, I just think that's a horrible, can you have closure? I, I think you can have closure that he's passed, but you'll never have closure I of that agree. event. You can't have closure. I mean, especially you think if about that if constantly. He, if he went to his deathbed, not ever admitting it, and there's no doubt that he did it. Yeah. Look, I can't speak for the Goldmans and I don't want to even try, but if it were me, I don't think I could have that closure. You know, this is just another chapter in the saga, yeah. essentially. You know, I think people are fascinated because you, it's such a, you know, a big role in the trial. I mean, your life changed instantly since 1995, yeah. 94, 95. But talk to, the, talk to us about the backstory with you and Nicole, because that's where it started. It's not like you knew OJ beforehand. Right. You were friends with Nicole, close friends, had a friendly relationship with her where you lived in her guest house before that at right. Gretna Green. And then talk about how the scenario unfolded where you ended up in the bungalow at OJ's house. Well, the whole thing was that I went on a, I, I worked with this uh, actor, a wonderful, wonderful actor and a friend of mine named Grant Kramer. And I'll just sort of do cliff notes of it. And he and I went to Aspen and uh, Grant was a, a celebrity and he did a lot of events and met Nicole. They, they met each other before while she was married uh, at some of the skiing events that went on in Aspen. So we went to Aspen for a New Year's Eve and they connected again. Nicole was divorced at the time. Their eyes met and I was sort of the third wheel, the funny person on their getting together. Now, she was not with OJ at the time. So when everybody went back to LA, uh, I, I was living in Hermosa Beach. I became a friend of Nicole and uh, with Grant and seeing each other. And at one point, after hanging out a few times, I saw that she had a guest house and I was driving up from Hermosa. And if anybody knows that drive coming to LA with traffic, it's it's an hour, hour and 15 minutes. It's not that bad. I live in Manhattan Beach. It's not that bad. You're exaggerating. In the 90s, it was worse. <laughs> okay. We, so then she said, there's no one living in there. And uh, I said, can I? And that was how it all started. So I I became friends with Nicole and then the kids of, Nicole, of uh, Justin and Sydney became very close to them. And uh, so much so that... Uh, I was not the babysitter, but I was there for him, and I would just make him laugh and read with him, do homework, and uh, they even got a dog, and the dog, and they, the kids said, we want to name the dog Kato, and so the Akita was Kato also, so it was, it was honestly, it was a, a time of just laughter, love, and I had no romantic, nothing with Nicole, 100% friendship, and so that's how I started. When they started dating again, OJ and Nicole, obviously he wanted to meet me, and he, I, I guess, gave thumbs up to her. And so I was part of that clique. And that's how it all started. Yeah. And then Nicole moved into a house on Bundy. Um, and when she went to Bundy, it was no guest house. And they would just said, until you get a place, you can have a guest house here where I live. Yeah. So I got a bungalow there. And that's how it is. And so I stayed six and a half months, seven months uh, with uh, Nicole and about six and a half with OJ. So I think the important thing is that I had sort of have a room with a view. I saw both sides of how they live. Mm -hmm. I saw both sides of of um, anger. No, I never saw the violence, but I did see that they just couldn't make it work. Yeah. I remember one story you told on the show where you had to replace a screen door or something that he had knocked down. He had kicked yeah. down, right? Coming yeah, during the trial. It was a 911 call, and I, I wasn't there when the door was kicked down, but obviously he yeah. had done it, and it was the French doors. And so Nicole and I hammered it shut, and the police had come. Did you ever try to speak to her and say, hey, as a friend, this thing's going nowhere. Did you ever feel like she was in danger? Did you ever feel like as her friend that was close to her, that you had to give her some sort of message that you're seeing some things maybe that she can't? You know, what I did is I went back to everything I do when I grew up with my, my family, my mom and dad, large family we had. If my parents rarely had arguments, rarely, and if they did, I never not saw my dad end up kissing my mom and then making up and then laughing. So I tried to bring that in and say, why do you guys fight? You got beautiful kids. You got everything in the world. So I could never figure that out. And then I, I sort of realized that money really isn't everything. It's just to have a, a good home and just to have a relationship that worked. Yeah. And that one did not work. You know, we always talk about OJ being a narcissist 
or worse, right? And he's got all the, all the signs of that. You wonder, is this something that he would want to get off his chest? I mean, all you can do is speculate, but the guy you knew, do you think he would carry something like this all the way to his grave? Or do you think something in his conscience would kick in and think, maybe let me give some of these people a little peace? But I would imagine in his mind, then, that's how everybody would judge him going forward. And he wants to continue this charade that he didn't do it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think he—I think he's, he died with the truth that he knew, and that's it. No one else knows. He died with it. So, um, and, and he was narcissistic, a narcissistic person, and um, he loved adulation. He loved being the fans. He loved that. So he wanted to be around— Everybody's still loving him. And I think people made up their mind. People that either thought he's guilty, not guilty. He had that group and he, he lived with that. Yeah. So I think that's um, where it is. And that's why I brought up earlier. I, I don't know how your feelings are, but I, uh, I think you have to have a penance on your deathbed. You just have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you're it's, right there. This is it. I wonder if he had, he announced that he had cancer, I think, a year and a half ago. But he kept it on the down low. So I don't know what it was, if it was pancreatic cancer. I don't know if anybody's even reported that yet. Or you would think that maybe there was a family member, unless they were protecting the secret for him for so long, or maybe they just, it's 30 years later and they just wanted to discuss anything but that. Right. I don't know. Yeah. And I, I don't know either. I don't, I don't know really even the closeness uh, when he was in Vegas with the kids. I don't know where it was. I don't know how often he saw them or anything. So I just think he... Uh, Pretty much had his life up there, whatever he was doing. Yeah. I think just golfing. Yeah. Does it seem like 30 years ago? Does it seem like a long time ago? It's kind of crazy that this is the 30-year no. anniversary. There's going to be a number of big documentaries this year. Next year, it'll be the 30-year anniversary of the trial. This year, the 30th anniversary of the, of the murders. Does it seem like it was that long ago? Are some of these moments just emblazoned in your mind where you can't forget them and that, that the memory is, is still really strong? It's the perfect way to put it. The memories are so strong. It does not seem like 30 years ago. It's amazing that it's 30 years ago. And, you know, when you go on your social media feeds, when I, I see the pictures of the trial, I see the pictures they posted me and all that. And I'm telling you, it, it's, I'm, I'm very affected by it because I remember that moment. I remember certain moments. And I remember moments, I mean, even getting the phone this morning, you get, I get that queasiness in my stomach of something's wrong. And even, even now, I'm not so comfortable talking about things with the trial. I, I think it's because I think it was such a dark period. I don't like being in the dark, I like the light, and I like it being a fun person. And and for you knowing me, that I to be serious this for for so long, it's um it's not so much a difficulty, but it's not me. And it's uh, it's going back to this dark period of, let's face it, I I never, I've never in my life, of, uh, was in a courtroom in my life. And the first time, not in parking tickets, Tom, anything. It was the first time was for a double homicide, for for. A, a person that I was living on, on the, this property with and a, a woman that I, I knew as a friend. And uh, I didn't know Ron, but later in life, I, you know, I knew Kim and all that. I know the love they have for him and what a great guy he is. So that's it. So it all comes back to me. It all, everything comes back to this, this, these moments. So that's what I'm kind of going through now. I'm just reliving the thoughts and, and things, you know, there's some clarity to it uh, that, that uh, maybe two weeks ago I didn't have that clarity, but this puts it right back. It puts me right back in that situation. I would imagine it does. And life is so crazy because if you had done anything differently, if you had a trip where you were out of town or if you had an acting gig or something and you weren't there, you wouldn't be this witness to history where you have the most important perspective, I think, of anybody because you were close to Nicole, very close. You lived there and then you were involved in the actual dramatic moments when it all went down. I mean, you were there the night before, hours before, yeah. right? And you have amazing stories for all of this. And I think for our audience, it's worth telling some of these. And, and, and you were there when these very famous detectives, Phil Van Adder, Tom Lang, Mark Furman, all showed up at your door at, what, 4.30 or 5 in the morning, yeah. hours after the murder. Right. So, you know, we talked to uh, Tom Lang on our show, but uh, it's, it's, it's amazing that the knock on the door that I, uh, even that night I kept saying uh, to the detectives of, uh, First of all, when they came to my door, I didn't know who they were, but I let them in. And then they said to me after the, in my place, four of them, by the way, we, uh, it was Vanetta Lang, Furman, and uh, uh, Detective Phillips. And then they just went around my room and asked me what I wore last night. I still don't know what's going on. And I pointed out everything, what shoes I had on, where my clothes were. Did you say, so, what is this about? Were you I, trying to get to the bottom of why I didn't they were say there? that. I said immediately, did OJ's plane crash? Because I knew he left for a trip to Chicago. So... That, that was it. I didn't know anything else going on. And um, 
And then uh, I mentioned to uh, Furman, I said, I don't know if this is a big thing. I kept thinking we had an earthquake and my picture moved. And it was a wall. It didn't have a window. It was just a wall and these picture moved. So I thought we had an earthquake. So it was back there. And that's where they went back there. And later on, we found out that's where they found the bloody glove. And the bloody glove led to so many things. It became a topic where uh, part of the trial there, uh, you know, I did an interview with BBC and they, they bring the pop culture of it all. And it was the Johnny Cochran starting the, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And that was the glove. And then the trial itself had so many sayings and it be, you know, it was very Shakespearean. Yeah, it was showbiz. Yeah. That was the very first reality show. That's how reality <clears throat> yeah. television started. Larry King told you that. Everybody knows that. There's there's never been a bigger story since. There's never been a bigger story beforehand. And there'll never be anything that can capture the imagination of the whole world like this just because it was a different time. Right. right? You're not distracted by social media and all these other things. This was the only thing going on. And it had to be carried out on live television. So people like you became known all over the world. You had to be in the top 10 of most recognizable people in, a, in the entire planet. Yeah, and I, you know, Tom, I, 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 I became famous for the wrong reasons. I'm the first to admit that. And I, I want people to know that, 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 you know, anybody that makes fun of me or whatever, it's fine. I, I realized that I, through the most horrific situation, I became popular. And it, it was nothing that I, I wanted to become popular for, but I knew that was my blueprint in life, that, you know, I came out here to be an actor. I was doing readings and auditions and shot commercials. So I became instantly over famous overnight from the most horrific situations. Um, now, what can I do with that? I, there's nothing I can do about the past. Everything is about the present and the future, and I can make life better for myself and for anybody else. And that's why I really do have an outlook of paying it forward. I want everything to be better for everybody else. And that's, that's the God's honest truth. You know, it's crazy because after the trial, you really didn't have any interaction with OJ again, did you? I mean, maybe your paths crossed one time, you said, at the civil trial in the bathroom. Yeah. Was that it? My deposition, that was it. And uh, uh, one time, but I didn't cross paths him, but he was on the same golf course I was on. Okay. So That's it. That's like, it. Never, never never by him to, like, he never yeah. looked at you like, hey, buddy, or anything like that. I no. mean, where a guy like that could just wipe the memory bank clean of something horrific like that that happened and think that he's back in time. Well, I was in deposition saying things that were truth about him that were very derogatory okay. towards him. So, uh, you know, during the depositions, I was speaking my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then after the first or two breaks, I go to the bathroom. He's in there. After I said these things, I was I couldn't I wanted to get out of the bathroom. And that's it. So you know, it's interesting because, you know, he hasn't paid the Goldmans, right? Yeah. That's why he moved to Florida. That's why he lives in Las Vegas. But he's got to have a fortune, right? He still gets the pension from the NFL. Who knows what he has left real estate wise or whatever else. But I don't know the answer to this, but it'd be interesting to see if they can collect some money now. Like if there's something that is required for him to turn over, but that's I don't know. for another day. Yeah, I don't even know how that works yeah. with that. Yeah. Uh, go back to the night before, because a guy like this, if you had seen him enough, right? Where maybe you saw that little, that little snap where a different part of his... You know, his, his personality would come out, the anger would flash. Did you sense anything I, that night I, I, that I, could go that direction? I didn't. I, I didn't. I always, I, I said that he seemed to be in deep thought. And that's still in my mind of being in the, we went on a drive. I didn't know we we're going to McDonald's. That became the, a famous thing that we went to McDonald's. I didn't have no idea. I just asked if I can go for this because I was starving. He's going to get something to eat. He came to my door. So I'm telling this to the detectives and, uh, and we go to a drive through at McDonald's. So I don't even eat meat, but I got a chicken sandwich and he had these uh, a quarter pounder or two and he ate them immediately. These in a, two bites. And I thought I'd eat the rest of my food at his place. And then they he pulled up and I walked to his main, the p main part of the house yeah. by the kitchen. And I walked and I saw when I turned around, he was still at the, at his door of the car about 20 yards away. And I, then I said like, Oh God, he doesn't want me to eat here. You want to say, okay. I said, okay. So I went to my room and that's the last I saw sure. him until he left for the, uh, the flight with the limo driver taking him. And that was what? That was, Less than an hour later, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I, I, with the timeline. But, um, you know, the, the everything in my life, uh, I'll tell you some of the changes that happened because you, you mentioned timelines and two things that are so important is all because of uh, being questioned and, and going through a trial of my my life. I, I lived my life for these 30 years that I'm so aware of every moment. Like uh, I'm, I'm married now. Before when I was dating, though, I would always say, okay, I dropped you off at this time. 
I would listen to a song on the radio. I would mark it down that at this time, this station played this song. I saw a car. I would write plates on. I'm living this life for 30 years of always knowing what happened in my timeline because I saw how important it was. And it was just, it was so much to live with because you have to know everything. You have to know what you eat, what you eat, what time. And uh, I start living that way. Even and now? You still that I, way? Yeah, I, I kind of always want to make sure of right. where I, I I always make notes. It's just part of me now that I do it of uh, always being aware of what's going on. And uh, another reason why I bring that up is because I did a podcast with Kim Goldman and her, her brother lost his life, of course, but everyone knows of Ron. And I told Kim, I said, Kim, I, I, I have these nightmares and these dreams that I, I want you to know that I, I believe that I invited myself to, for that drive to McDonald's that I didn't know was going to be a drive to McDonald's. I invited myself in that timeline, and I could tell by the way OJ was contemplating. He just stood at the uh, door of my guest house, and it seemed like a lifetime. that he goes, oh, yeah, sure, but right. I could come along, and I thought... I think I screwed up his timeline. Right, so you beat yourself up over that for a long time, Still, right? Carrying yeah. a lot of guilt. I think you've kind of maybe come to yeah. peace with that, but explain to it a little bit more. Well, because I came peace with it because Kim said, no, yeah, don't, yeah. don't ever think that. So she said, "That's no, okay. don't think, don't put that on you. And uh, so hearing her say that uh, mattered a lot to me. I'm glad she said that because it wasn't yeah, anything it was, that had anything to it do was, with you. Yeah, it was just, I invited myself and it happened. But explain to me why you think that you did mess with the timeline. So you think OJ wanted to have the story that he went to McDonald's alone? So he he wouldn't have to like have someone corroborate that? E everything's everything's hindsight, so I don't know, but I think that was to establish an alibi. That he knew that he came to my door, that he was uh going to go out to eat. I didn't know McDonald's. he was gonna go out to get something to eat. So he and just told you that as a flippant yeah, response. He wanted Little to know did he know that could, you'd say you'd come with. He wanted to know if I could break a hundred dollar bill and I couldn't, so I gave him forty that I had. And that was it. So all that went on. And I don't think he thought I'd say, can I come along? And so when I did that, he, I think in his mind, because it was like, it was a long time. Of him trying to think, he's trying to figure out something in his head of what's going to happen. My, this is my speculation, what my belief is, but it makes sense. Yeah, I guess. Um, how weird was he acting when he went to that McDonald's? Do you remember? Quiet. I mentioned it was just quiet, seemed deep in thought. That was it. Just deep in thought. Not, you know, when uh, you're with someone that's a, the celebrity and all that, you don't want to start asking. You, you've got to be the person that's quiet because you see you're, you're stepping on your, out of your boundary and you're like, oh, hey, what's going on? So I was just quiet. I adapted to what he was feeling. So that made me quiet. Yeah. I didn't ask too many questions. Yeah. These are unbelievable stories. The one you had mentioned when the detectives were at, at your door and you told them that you thought you heard an er or felt an earthquake the night before. Yeah. That was technically OJ coming over the wall, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Tom Lang did a TV show that I, I did his uh, a TV show and explained that. And then he just showed me uh, in the show itself how much evidence they had, how uh, you know, this thing that Vanetta, Detective Vanetta just rings on in my mind always, and I bring it up a lot, is that, you know, after so many interviews, I kind of uh, became friends with the detective. Not that we hung out, but I became friends and talked to him, and they thought, okay, he's an okay guy. And then Vanetta just said, yeah, Cato, let me tell you something about this, 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 uh, this case. To us as detectives, this is a two-minute Columbo episode that they had so much it would only last it two minutes. That's how much evidence they had. Yeah. Go back and watch the episodes that we had with Tom Lang. We had two of them. He's such a class dude. I yeah. mean, he is just the epitome of LAPD, detective, old school, getting the job Come done. Up. No doubt in his mind, OJ did it, yeah. zero. And keep in mind, they have warehouses full of evidence yeah. that never got shown in trial that Tom did a TV show around. So, yeah. I mean, imagine these guys. Their job is to you know, solve these crimes. And in their mind, they did. And then all these factors that, that they couldn't control ended up making the difference. Was there a turning point in the trial where you thought he's going to get away with this? Did you ever think I, that he was going to be found innocent or did it shock you? Yeah, I, the, there was no turning point. It was the first day I was testifying when I walked into the courtroom and I saw the, some of the jurors waving, uh, waving and him waving back. And I thought, this, is this supposed to happen? And, um, it was it was different of um you know i i was there testifying 6 days 6.5 i think it was and uh, w when i was doing this uh the trial you know robert Shapiro was on the defense one of the lawyers very very nice gentleman and he'd come up to me and said my son would love an autograph and all that i i, I thought this is surreal 
And then uh, that's when uh, Larry King had called me the first reality star. Then I started realizing this is kind of a show. And even the things like this, the glove, uh, if the glove don't fit, you must have quit. And the fights that they would get in. I mean, let's face it, they, um, the, they did a show on it. Ryan Murphy did the 1-8 Emmys yeah. on the American Crime Story. And uh, ESPN won an Oscar. So it's, it is seen sort of as entertainment, but it's real life. Yeah. And people saw this as a soap opera, but it was on during soap opera hours, but it wasn't. It was real life, real people affected. Yeah, and that's, uh, that was the birth of reality TV. Yeah. Larry King told you that. Uh, and then you watched The Verdict with none other than... The late Barbara Walters. Yeah. So many people have passed away. Another this, yeah. surreal moment. Yeah. Was she taken aback during the reading of The Verdict? Did she act startled at all, or was she expecting it? I, oh, I think she was expecting it. Uh, I think she was thinking that uh, he was going to be found innocent. And, uh, the, you know, the, and then we and this also started uh, L.A. and well, actually the, the America going backwards in time because it was split screens of African-American and white. And that's still today. So it went backwards in time with uh, uh, L.A. It just became so prejudiced and uh yeah, and you know, it, was, it was all because well, the media sort of did it. They they lined it up and showed everybody reactions. So and it was two years after Rodney King. Yeah, and that was a big part of it as well. Was it difficult for you to wrap your arms around the fact that you were famous because of this? Was it difficult, like especially if you yeah. had opportunities that came from this, hosting opportunities, appearances, because you became a celebrity. You did, and you couldn't control it. It was going to happen. Yeah. You, you would have been a celebrity without this. You were trending that way as an actor. Right. Thanks. I, well, I mean, the one story where you read for yeah. Dumb and Dumber is a classic story. Well, that is I, I tested for uh, 1994. I tested my friend Aaron Meyerson. I bring this up. He was at New Line Cinema and I, we played basketball together. We hung on on weekends. He was one of the producers of the film. He said, you got to read the script. He gave me the script. I've got it somewhere at home. He says, you've got to be in this. And at my time, I had the long hair. And I read it. I said, this is fantastic. I wrote in and it was the Fairley brothers. I met with Rick Montgomery, the casting director. They put me on film, uh, on tape. And uh, man, I was like, this is, uh, my life is just going. That was a week before the murders happened. And life somewhat stopped. And I, you know, I had my SAG card now yeah. well, for 40 years of, um, of being around. Uh, once again, I stress that I became, I was, became famous for the wrong reasons. But my, my goals never stopped. The, because of becoming famous for this, I still wanted to do what I'm doing. I still wanted to be out there. That was a Jeff Daniels actor. role in, in, yeah. uh, in Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, the, the long hair. So, um, yeah. But what, what does a person do, though, when given an opportunity? Do you become a sloth? Do you say, no, I don't want anything? You, I, I have a daughter. I've got a, a, you know, I have a mortgage. I do all these things. You have to work. And even though people would say, oh, he's got the job because of this, I would know that going in, everything I did was under a microscope. So I knew I had to perform and be that much more ready mm -hmm. and to impress people. Yeah. And I thought I did that. Yeah. You came, you came to L.A. from Milwaukee, very close-knit family, yeah. big family. Was that difficult? Because you didn't have any, like, immediate family members right here in L.A. to, like, help you? You could go live with them for a while? Did I, you feel isolated? I, I didn't. Because I talked to them every day. And then I had my closest friends still from high school that were one gentleman was a, a lawyer who was on the phone with that night. At that time, he was a, a DA in San Diego. And the, the reason I'm on the phone with him is because I was saying to him in a joking way before the murders happened, I was like, oh, yeah, I just had dinner with OJ. You know, I'm doing the little thing like being cocky. And uh, then my other friend, Will, uh, Tom O'Brien, was my the lawyer friend. And Will Stump was my still my, uh, my best buddy. And uh, just... Talking to these guys, first of all, they make you very humble, and you're, and they realize what I was going through. Best support, my family, best support. My father had passed away, but my mom was alive, and that was the effect on her that it had was just devastating to her. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but I talked to them, and it made a huge difference to have a big family. Huge difference. Yeah. And the fact that you're from Milwaukee, the grounded oh, people. Completely. Yeah. Oh, completely. That so, you know, I, you know, it's funny time that so many people. <laughs> would come up to me during this time and ask me, first of all, do, do you need to see a psychiatrist? Do you want to, you want to, yeah. you okay and all that? I said, yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm pretty tough. I don't need a psychiatrist. I know who I am. Yeah. So I think you have a kind of belief in yourself. You know who you are. You're not going to, and I have nothing against psychiatrists and all. I just was like, no, I'm pretty complete. I, I, I know the situation and I can handle, uh, you know, I have to be Teflon to have people that were beating me up to, Say oh, had worst. to. And, and oh, nobody yeah. really Look, knows how bad it people, was for you. People, I was called everything from the pariah, a, a freeloader, a dummy, a liar, uh, even an assassin's target. But 
hey, the court of public opinion can be wrong. So I had a 30 years later yeah. proof to them. And uh, I'm Wisconsin, so cream does rise to the top. And that's America's dairy land. So you know, I'm making it. it so yeah, that's I think that's sure. where I'm at. But it, it took a lot of strength, a lot of inner strength, a lot of probably you have faith, you know, a strong family that could back you up. Because you mentioned stories, too. You're driving. You had a convertible back in the day where people would spit on you. Yeah. Throw gum at you. Yeah. I like, get, literally. I got rid of that convertible that yeah. week. That was there because uh, I people could, I was very approachable. I didn't mind being approached, but when they approached for violence, it was it was bad. And uh, it, the spitting, you know, people wanted to fight. I was just like, oh my God, there's lots of hate. But you know, everything everything subsides yeah. after with time. Yeah, I was actually around OJ the weekend that he got arrested in Vegas. It's really a crazy story. Wow. I know. So it's just you you saw him once or twice. He was all over our party. The weekend that he got arrested in Las Vegas, it was crazy because he was trying to sell and film a reality show on himself. So he had a film crew that he brought along. And one of my friends who was uh, a TV host for Extra, we were having his birthday party at the real world suite at, at the Palms. Yeah. And, and then we were having dinner that night and he's down hanging out with us, trying to. I mean, you know, OJ, how yeah. he can be. And and with his crew, it was with, with his crew that he had hired to film him. And then. He just showed up at the party like he, he got in there somehow and it's so bizarre. And then a few hours later, he's getting arrested, which is another great documentary that we covered on this show. The arrest in Vegas and how that judge, Judge Glass. I mean, you know that she made that personal, right? When she sentenced to him for whatever he had, like 15 years, 15, 20 years, yeah. the, the absolute max you could get. She basically admitted that she was it was payback for what didn't happen in L.A. But, yeah, it, it's a, it's the, the the end of a very. um just memorable historic chapter in American history. Did you see Caitlyn Jenner's post today? No. Rotten hell or something like that. I can't remember. Then she took all kinds of heat on social after she did that. Like no, no uh, remorse whatsoever that he's dead, but it was just, if you, it just, it just triggers so many feelings from people, right? Right. There's no gray area here. People are just really hot on this subject one way or another. Right. And I, you know what? I, I, I released a statement cause I was asked to do a statement and I, I just wanted to, and I, I just, I think it's always about the, the, the kids, not so much about, about the, you know, how they're doing. Yeah. So I think that's what you have to make it about. So, you know, some of the other stories you'll see today, too, is just educating the younger population that what happened because they weren't around for this. If you know right. somebody in their late 20s, mid 30s, they have no clue. They didn't live through this, which right. is unbelievable because it just it doesn't seem like 30 years ago. So you'll see, see stories on the Bronco. Where is it now? It's in a museum in Tennessee somewhere. And just all the other th artifacts and things that came from that trial. Do you yeah. have anything? I remember that you showed me the key that you yeah, had. I still have my guest house key. To, to OJ's bungalow. Uh, yeah, you still, still have that key. Still have that Tried key. to give it to Larry King. He didn't want it. Yeah. What else? Do you have stuff in a storage locker? Uh, you know what? I've got some notes. i got some personal things. i got some uh, uh, back then you made cassette tapes. i got a song playlist of uh, Nicole's playlist for her. Uh, uh, yeah, I've got certain things that I packed away. And, uh, you know, I do write stuff and we'll, we'll see. But, yeah, it's... The, the 30 years, I, it's in a blink of an eye. You know that expression goes by in a blink of an eye? It is so true. And when you're younger, you don't think that. You don't think it's a blink of an eye. It's a blink of an eye of how everything is, time's gone by. Yeah. And how many people are uh, passed on since that trial. It's yeah. amazing. I remember exactly where I was when I heard the news report of the murders. Of course, I remember where I was during the trial. All this stuff. Yeah. You were there, and you mentioned it was six and a half days that you had to testify. Yeah. And there was nothing, this was not an episode of Suits, right? This was not glamorous on any level. They tucked you in basically a broom closet with it no was, electronics, no nothing, nothing it was no a, newspaper. It was, a, it was a closet, like a, a coat hanger closet, basically. And that was it. I and stayed you, in there waiting. No closed circuit TV to follow no, the trial. They don't want anything. No. I popped my head out, maybe use the bathroom, get some air, and that was it. I waited in a room. And uh, uh, the the woman that was in there was uh, ran the office up there. It was Patty Fairbanks. I remember names, certain names because it comes up. I forget. And then when it pops up like a, a situation today, the names just come like that. It just yeah. you hit a, a nerve hits and you can remember so much more. At what point of the trial did you testify? Was it early or was it the no, middle of it? I think it was the middle. So what I, were you doing before that? Were you following it on TV? No, I was. Uh, I had a meeting where I'm sequestered. I cert certain things, but I knew like with the hard copy shows, current affairs were at that time. I would know certain things to have my mom don't watch this, don't watch this. And I remember this story that came out 
and I'm, I'm bringing it up because it was the most devastating that the uh, there was no McDonald's. They said it was Cato uh, uh, getting um, crack. Uh, what, what's another word for it? Uh, whatever. Drugs? Meth. Are you talking no, about no, real crack, drugs? but meth. Um, meth? Meth that I was telling. Meth. It hurt me so bad because I don't, <laughs> I don't do drugs. I do. I'm as healthy as can be. So my mom would hear the stories, but they had a guy in a silhouette that was doing all these shows. And I said, I want to confront this person who it was. Later on, it was found out that it was all staged, but it went on and on and all these shows. Yeah. And it was devastating to my I, family. I believe it. And it would have been a hundred times worse now with social media. Yeah. It's actually almost a blessing that because there was no social media. When, when something goes on TV, yeah. people believe. Yeah. Back then. Even, <laughs> you just believe something. Now you repetition, think the opposite when you repetition, heard it Yeah. 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 No, I was, get it. I look and 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 this was every story every day. And you just it, it was a throwback today. How every single network could not stop talking about this all day. Yeah. Well, so you talk shows, everything. Yeah. Not everything. And it you, was in sitcoms, it was on the top of talk shows. Dancing Edos, yeah. pop culture, it was everywhere. You probably even ha haven't even had a chance to really process all this. That not that you need to be prepared for it, but because you're in a <laughs> in a sprint right now with all these media appearances. Yeah. I, yeah, it's it's not process. This is cathartic talking about it now. Yeah, it's the first time I've actually sort of seen someone face to face mm -hmm. and to talk about it with you. So yeah, it's very cathartic to get this out. And uh, because of talking like this, I remember more. Yeah, and that's it. You're watching One Degree of Scandalous. Cato and I have this podcast. We're back. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new to it. Check out some past episodes and and follow us every single week because the content is outstanding. We're yeah. working on a show that Cato's going to be starring in that uh, we'll have more details yeah. to reveal hopefully very, very soon. But there's a lot of stuff going on in your well, life. Well, yeah, you know, you bring that up too. And I, I was thinking of uh, uh, Larry King saying the first reality star. But my life sort of was actually born on court TV. And that's where I was seen every day. So I became, once again, is it Cato the character soap opera? No, it's Cato Real and Court TV made it a real yeah. thing for me. Yeah. You know, going back to the trial real quickly, I just want to ask you this question. Was that the most scared you've ever been in your life? Were you nervous, intimidated? Were you freaking out? What was it like? Because it's a small, courtrooms are small at LA County. They're in downtown. They're not yeah. big. It's not like the stadium or anything. You're in this. You have these famous faces in front of you, the attorneys. You understand the magnitude and the importance of yeah. why you're there. There had to be unbelievable tension that you could just feel that you could cut. Mm, and here I, you are, announced to the world, Brian I, Cato Kalin. What, what, the, the part that I think was the, the, that affected me the most is that I, I was on the edge of my seat on everything in my life. I didn't know, like, uh, you know what's going to happen next. I didn't know uh, what story might come out or what... What's gonna? What will happen in my life? Of, um, for instance, someone wanted to fight and all that. So everything was sort of on edge, um, just with what was going to happen. And um, I'm sure it led to ulcer and everything because I didn't know. I didn't know how to prepare for something like this. Yeah. So I kept saying, "Okay, you know who you are and all that." And that's when I would talk to my friends. But it's hard to. It's when someone says bad things about me, I don't take it as well. Someone saying good things because I wasn't raised that way. So I start saying, why does someone hate me? And it really affected me. It just affected my life. I couldn't, I wasn't one of those guys who just, oh, blow it away. I know. Uh, well, you like making people happy. You enter a room 100%. and you, you raise the energy level. And you want everybody to feel great. And you do. That is who you are. In testifying, I didn't do jokes, but people, I guess, gravitated towards it. But I was being honest. Yeah. And my replies were, they got a laugh, but it wasn't me trying to get a laugh. Of course It was not. just, it was cathartic. It, it was who I was. It was just real and organic and raw. And it wasn't like for two minutes. You're there for hours and hours yeah. and hours and this stuff comes out. And all you could do is be yourself because you're afraid of lying. The last thing you want to do is not tell the truth there. Right. And then you probably have, do I have the facts straight in my mind? Am 100%. I getting this right? There's 100%. lives at stake here. 100%. It's so, so, so you, big. You become a deer in the headlights because yeah. you're trying to think of, was that my review? And, and then, I, you know, even looking back, I go, I, I understand why people would say that, but I, I want them to also understand it's because I wanted to be truthful. I it, wanted to answer 100% honest. Is your testimony seared into your memory where if somebody hadn't you do the transcript right now, could you recall it? I, I, I could probably most of it, not all of it, because there's so much. I do have the transcripts at home, and uh, it's it's notebooks full. Yeah. And um, I don't read them at night. So I, if something comes up, I go, oh, yeah, I said that. But most of the stuff I, the, most of the stuff I would, yes, I'd recall it. Mm -hmm. Well, look, we're going to wrap this up in just yeah. a second. You know, you are the most famous house guest in the history of the planet. You've done an amazing job with your life having to endure this. And because of that, everybody always wants to know because of the proximity you had to this couple, this terrible, volatile situation. Did you think OJ did it? And 
Unequivocally, what's your answer? Uh, yeah, I, I think he's guilty. I think he's a guilty man. I've said that before. Uh, my opinion wasn't the same opinion as the jury, but yes, I think he's guilty. The civil trial said he was guilty also. So uh, yeah, that's my my opinion. Yeah, he's a guilty man. Yep. I want to thank Podcast One for letting us yeah. use the studio today. This is beautiful. This works out great. Anything else, Cato, that you want to get off your chest or feel like you want to communicate? You had a great 40-second statement that's you know traveling around the world a few times right now. On I, social media and other I, news outlets. I, you know, uh, Tom, I think, uh, like I said, this is cathartic for me. I think that statement says it all. Okay, great. It's a perfect statement. You showed it to me before you you sent it out. Yeah. I'm an editor, and I had nothing to edit, nothing to fix. It, oh, was, uh, it was ideal. Yeah, it was th thanks so much. And I, I want to yeah. appreciate also thank Podcast One for this time in the studios to talk about this and uh, uh, to Sean and Gabby for helping us out. Yep, uh, thanks, guys, okay. especially on short notice. We really do appreciate it. But, Kato, we, we appreciate your sincerity, your openness. Everybody loves you. I mean, it's uh, impossible well, not to love Kato Kalen. Well, I appreciate you saying but trust me, there's, there's I, I like to think that, too. Well, we'll find them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we'll take care of them. Don't worry. Um, but, look— we're moving forward. There's a lot of great things on the path for you. We're all excited about that. And uh, man, thanks for sharing this because yeah. we, I speak for hundreds of millions of people that are just fascinated by this topic. We can't help it. They're, everybody's out there. This is real. And to get this from you, and let's continue the conversation as we resume the podcast every week now. What do yeah, you say? I love it. Thanks so much. And great to see you again. Okay. Great seeing you, Kato. Thanks Bye. for this. Thanks, everybody. Again, subscribe to the channel. One Degree of Scandalous. Follow us on social, especially Kato here in the coming days. Uh, follow me. We'll give you uh, clips from this show. I'm sure some of these clips we're going to release for, for uh, media around the world as well. And watch for Kato tonight. He's going to be everywhere, and you're going to see him in the next coming days. Kato, Thanks. great seeing you. Thanks, Thanks for that. Okay, bye. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll catch you next week.